Hello, my loves. My name is Jasmine Brantley of Inspire Me Jazzy, as well as the fabulous ladies of Inspire Me Jazzy. And I am back with yet another live breakdown as we continue this beautiful yet hard journey towards health and wellness using our Bible reading plan entitled, Do You Want to Be Made Whole? Hear me. I don't know about you all, but this is one of those challenges where you almost are looking forward to the end of the month. Like, listen, <laughs> the way these past couple of months have hit us, it's like, really, God? Like, are you like, is this what we're doing? Like, again and again and again? Hey, Naisha. Like, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I need it. I know it's necessary. And for many of us, it's way past due. But if we are honest, this hurts. This is hard. This isn't comfortable at all. Not in real life, right? Like day after day after day of getting read your rights, <laughs> of having to look at yourself, of realizing that things are still present that you thought were gone, of realizing that you hadn't really dealt with certain things, you just buried certain things, of realizing that there are more layers to this, that it's deeper than this, that there is a root cause to this that you hadn't even realized, that this is generational, right? That this is already trickling down into the lives of your children and or into the lives of those that you have influence over. You see, it's one thing to go to God to tell him on others, <laughs> but it's another when God begins to sit you down and tell you about you, right? Yeah, I hear what they did, but what did you do? Yeah, I hear what they did, but how did you respond? Yeah, I hear what they did, but what did I tell you to do? Yeah, I hear what they did, but aren't you not, you were supposed to cut them off a long time ago, right? <laughs> yeah, I hear what they did, but you are in relationship with me responding like someone who isn't. Hear me, when he takes away that past that you have used for so long to remain stagnant, to remain angry, to remain uh, unrighteous, to act unjust, to, to, to participate in injustice, to remain bitter and unforgiving, honey, at some point you just, want to stop and take a break from the entire process like listen god <laughs> this is not okay i am not okay this is a lot for you to show me about myself right okay well maybe it's maybe it's just me and since it's just me i guess we are ready for more so let's get to it today i want to take it back to day 12 assigned reading entitled by his stripes we are healed coming from the book of Isaiah chapter 53. Now for the purposes of today's discussion, I will not be dealing with this verse by, by verse, but I will absolutely speak to a lot of what is said in this passage of scripture as well as an additional passage of scriptures. Okay, you see, as I deal with the reality of today, well, day 12's assigned reading as it relates to our topic of study, I also want to take a moment to present to some and possibly introduce to others the most important person of my life, okay? But before I get into the swing of things, I wanna make sure that we are clear on something. Um, the book of Isaiah is a prophetic book, which means that there will be instances where we will be reading things in this particular book that includes divine communication, divine insight, words inspired by God concerning things that had not and or has not yet come to pass. Hear me, you will see a lot of things being spoken to as if they have already happened when this was written, some commentators say, over 700 years prior. So you will read things present tense that aren't really present tense physically and that's simply because when God releases a word, when God declares something to be so, you can absolutely consider it done. You can speak to it, approach it, address it, believe it, expect it, count it as so, because his word will never return to him void. Now, with that being said, I would like to take a moment to present to you and or to introduce to you the subject of this particular passage. In this particular passage of scripture, God is speaking to the people of God using the prophet of God to declare what the future would be like for them. 
His people had rebelled against him. His people had turned away from him. His people had angered him by worshiping the works of their hands. His people took oaths in his name and they made mention of his name, but they really failed to be in relationship with him for real. They, they failed to be authentic and genuine. And as a result, they failed to live ethically and morally as someone should who carried his name. So he began to refine them and test them in what he called the furnace of affliction. But he did not do so without providing them with clear expectations concerning restoration. He begins to refer to, to himself as their redeemer, the one who pays the price in order to gain or regain the possession of something. So he begins to communicate concerning the means of this redemption that literally does not arrive on the earth according to commentators, until after 700 years after this particular passage of scripture is written. Yet and still, the clarity and the accuracy of what would be the portion of this means of redemption is unbelievable. So hear me, with the goal in mind of restoring the people of God to their creator, he begins to introduce us to one who the Lord called from his mother's womb. One who he had made his mouth like a sharp sword. One who he was hidden in the shadow of his hand. One who was like a sharpened arrow hidden in his quiver. One in whom he would be glorified. The one who would restore, who would restore Israel while also allowing his salvation to reach the ends of the earth. This one was Jesus Christ. However, in order to do this, Jesus would have to experience unspeakable things on earth. He would be despised, regarded as small, unimportant, insignificant, worthless, offensive. He would be scorned, mocked, insulted, disliked, undesired, and disrespected by mankind. He would be regarded with hate and disgust by the same nation that he came to restore. He would give his back to those who would strike him, beat him, hit him. <laughs> he would give his cheeks to those who would pluck out the hair from his beard. He would not hide his face from public shame or disgrace. He would allow people to spit on him. While he declared that the Lord God would help him. Therefore, he would not be disgraced, insulted, humiliated, dishonored. He says, therefore, I have set my face like a flint, like a hard rock, and I know that I will not be ashamed, disappointed, disconcerted. He declares that the one who justifies him is near him, who will contend with him, who will strive with him, who will come up against him. He says things like, who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. He, who is he who will condemn me? Listen, this, this mess with me. Can I be honest? This mess with me because at the end of the day, I know the story of Jesus. And I'm pretty sure some of you do too, right? Like, how can you be spit on, beat, insulted, mocked, disgraced, and then say, God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced? How can you stand in the face of a disgraceful situation and declare what seems to be the exact opposite of your experience? Hear me, it had to be because he, he knew something that they didn't. It had to be because he was speaking the word that had been released. Even if that word hadn't manifested in the earth as of yet, it had to be that he knew that those who came up against him wouldn't have the last say so concerning him because the one who justified him and helped him was near him. It had to be that he knew that even if it looked like they had the upper hand, even if it looked like it was it was it was over on this side, that there was still a resurrection, there was still an ascension and a second coming in the future that would switch up the game. He had to know something more than what they knew. Listen to me. Some of us have received a word. The word has been released from heaven. A word concerning healing, a word concerning restoration, a word concerning, concerning justice. Hear me, I don't know exactly what your word is, but for some of you, everything that 
that you are experiencing, everything that you are feeling seems to be contradicting the word that you received. God said, God, God you said you would heal him, yet he passed away. God, you said you would heal her, but she is getting worse. God, you said you would provide for me, yet I just lost my home and my job. God, you said I would bear a child, yet my womb remains barren. God, you said that I would not be put to shame, but they just humiliated me publicly. How is it that my experience seems to contradict your promise? Hear me, is it possible that we are simply looking at things from an earthly perspective without taking into account a heavenly perspective at all. Jesus literally declared that he would not be disgraced, knowing that he would be publicly disgraced. He would be spat on, insulted, mocked, disregarded, disrespected. So my question to you becomes, can you still declare healing even in death? Can you still declare healing when facing decline? Can you still declare provision despite the loss of your home and your income? Can you still declare fertility in the face of infertility? Can you still declare that you will be unashamed in the face of humiliation? Listen, just because the manifestation of the word does not look like you imagine and or what you preferred, it does not mean that it is still not coming to pass. He will not fall short of his word. So until you see it, you have every right to declare it. Whether it's this month or, or next month, whether it's this year or in three years, whether it's on this side of heaven or the other side of heaven, what he has spoken is truth. And his truth can be relied on. You can look for it, expect it, place your complete hope in it, in the name of Jesus. Let's keep it moving. In the book of Isaiah, we are told even more about this means of redemption, about Jesus Christ. We are told that he didn't have an impressive form, that there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. He didn't look like a king. He didn't walk like a king. He didn't talk like a king. Nothing that would draw your attention to him physically, right? Nothing that would make you take notice of him or desire to be close to him, to be in relationship with him. He was rejected by men, meaning he was dismissed and disregarded, deemed as inappropriate and unsuitable for many people. People, Jesus was simply not enough. <laughs> People hid their faces from him. They despised him and did not respect, admire, value, or appreciate him. He was a man of pain and sorrow. A man who experienced both physical and mental anguish. A man who knew feelings of distress caused by loss, disappointment, and other misfortunes. He was a man who was familiar with grief, with sickness, with those who were in an unhealthy physical or mental condition. Hear me, Jesus was sent in the earth to be crucified. This literally means that pain was a part of his purpose. He did not allow the presence of pain or the possibility of pain to keep him from operating in purpose. <laughs> Hear me. If Jesus would have lived a life, lived a life doing anything and everything that he could to avoid experiencing pain, rejection, betrayal, sorrow, or the like. Where in the world would we, we be? Where in the world would you and I be if Jesus lived a life doing everything that he could to avoid experiencing pain? <laughs> our salvation, our, our redemption, our restoration, our healing was directly connected to his pain. So my question becomes, Whose healing is directly connected to the pain that you refuse to face? Where are you operating outside of purpose because of the presence of and or the possibility of pain, rejection, betrayal, sorrow, grief, or the like? Are you attempting to save the lost? 
while intentionally avoiding the cross? <laughs> Let's keep it moving. According to Isaiah 53, verse 4, Jesus bore, carried, endured our sickness, our diseases, our disorders, our ailments, our afflictions, our infirmities, our infections, our illnesses, and he carried, bared the load, took on as his burden our pain, our suffering, our agony, our torment, our sorrow, our unhappiness, our depression, our regrets, our misery, our heartache, our despair, our disappointment. Hear me, I don't know if you've ever had to deal with depression. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with the weight of, of losing someone. I don't know if you've ever had to even bear the weight of, of someone else's uh, sorrows or, or struggles or unhappiness. But that is heavy. Just for one person. Just for losing one person. But Jesus carried it all for you and I. For the entire world. He carried all of this. For you and I, he was oppressed, subject to harsh and cruel treatment, weighed down, persecuted, abused, and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth. He was restrained, oppressed, and judged. He was cut off from the land of the living. Although he had done nothing wrong, nor was there any deceit or dishonesty on his lips, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him, to break him, to cause him to suffer for you and I. His soul, his life, his person was made an offering for our sin. Hear me, the scripture says the sight, the appearance, the face of Jesus was marred, disfigured, impaired more than any other man. His form, his structure, more than the sons of men. He poured out his soul unto death and was numbered, meaning he was considered a transgressor. Someone who was in rebellion against God. He was seen by others as someone who had been stricken, chastised, punished, judged by God his father and had been afflicted, humbled, brought low as a result of this punishment, as a result of this chastisement. Hear me, Jesus was willing to let people have erroneous perceptions of his pain. False perceptions of his suffering with you in mind. <laughs> Hear me clearly. When you have purpose in mind, defending yourself and or explaining yourself becomes unnecessary. Sometimes you just need to not open your mouth and say a word. You do not have to defend your decision to operate in purpose. It matters not who believes that your pain, your suffering is a result of punishment. You have to know where you stand with God. You have to know whether or not you are in the will of God. You have to know that God is going to get the glory out of your situation. You have to know what he declared concerning you despite what they may or may not believe to be true. They believe Jesus was being chastised by God for something he had done when really he was treated with irreverence and disrespect for me. My God, he, he was violated, dishonored, degraded for you. He was wounded, injured, afflicted with pain for our transgressions, for the times that we would overstep the limits of God's divine instruction, for the times that we would be guilty of wrongdoing, sin, injustice, offense. He was bruised, traumatized, crushed, broken, shattered, physically damaged for our iniquities. Our perversity, our deliberate desire to behave in an unacceptable way, our immorally and grossly unjust behavior, our wickedness, our defiance, our corruption, our rebellion, the chastisement, the discipline, the correction, the punishment for my peace, for your peace, for our prosperity, for our welfare, for our health. It was up on him. My God today and by his stripes, his bruises, 
his wounds, his blows. We are healed, restored to health, made well, free from injury or disease, free from ailment, made, made healthy, whole and sound, cured, cleansed, relieved of the symptoms of disease or conditions. Hear me, by his stripes, we are healed. Can we deal with this for just a moment? I want to make sure that we keep this scripture in context, right? Let's not forget that this passage of scripture is not necessarily referring to physical healing. It is referring to redemption, restoration, being healed and whole spiritually, being cleansed spiritually, being restored to perfect health spiritually. However, this particular passage of scripture is quoted in the New Testament as it relates to those who are demon possessed and sick. Hence the reason I believe that both physical and spiritual healing are directly connected to the stripes of Jesus. But hear me clearly. We cannot take this to mean that we will never get sick. That we will never experience physical death. That we will never experience disease. And if you do, you simply don't have the faith to believe what scripture said. That is not true. And we as believers should not ever communicate that to another individual. Because at the end of the day, we live in a fallen world. And as a result of what happened in the Garden of Eden, physical death is our portion. Scripture declares that our physical bodies are wasting away. So as an extension of God's grace, so that we don't have to live in a fallen state, a fallen world, for the, in a frail body for the rest of our lives, God grants us the ability to transition. And sickness becomes a part of that. So some sickness is a part of life. Let's be clear. Some sickness is a result of sin. And some sickness is satanic or demonic at root. Hence the reason you can't handle and or speak to all sicknesses and illnesses the same. But as it relates to this particular passage of scripture, a commentator put it this way. And I'm going to say this and I'm done. Healing is the passage. Healing in this passage is similar to salvation. As believers, we are saved. We are being saved and we will be saved. Walk with me. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will eventually be saved from the presence of sin. I'm going to say that again. We are saved from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. We are saved from the penalty of eternal damnation, right? We will not be eternally separated from God because we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. Pa sin should not have power over us. We break the power that sin has over us through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? We still struggle with sin. Sin is still a very real issue. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are being saved from the power of sin. Then we, are, we will eventually be saved from the presence of sin. In the presence of God, there will be no sin. When we are living with God in, in another life, in our afterlife, we will not experience the presence of sin any longer. Okay? So we are saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. So likewise, we are healed, hold, restored, cleansed spiritually through grace by faith. We are being healed made whole, restored, cleansed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And eventually we will be healed, whole, restored, and clean, both physically and spiritually as we prepare to live life eternally with Jesus. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and ask. But I want to say that again. I want you to see this as similar to salvation. We are healed whole, restored, cleansed spiritually through grace by faith. We are being healed, made whole, restored, cleansed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And eventually we will be healed, whole, restored, and clean, both physically and spiritually as we prepare to live life eternally with our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
This concludes my breakdown for day 12. If you all have any questions, again, comments, even you want to share feedback concerning today's video, please do not hesitate to share them with me or to leave them below. We would absolutely love to hear them. I love you all to life and I wish you a fabulous night. Mwah.